Well, I'd like to introduce our guest today, Nigel Whitson. Nigel Whitson is a creative capital and two-time Bessie award-winning queer non-binary trans interdisciplinary artist and writer. Whitson has been referred to as majestic and magnetic by the New York Times and is recognized by Brooklyn Magazine as a culture influencer. They are a 2018 MAP Fund recipient, a featured choreographer of the 2018 CC Biennial and 2018 through 2020 UBW Choreographic Center Fellow. Other recent awards include a U.S. Artist Fellowship nominee, a Camargo Jerome Foundation Fellowship, Dance and Process Residency, Hedgebrook, Hedgebrook Fellowship, Bogleasco Fellowship, Brooklyn Arts Exchange Artists Residency, among dozens of other residencies and awards across disciplines. Whitson engages in a very active bicoastal practice as an assistant professor of experimental choreography at UC Riverside and is founder of the NWA project. Whitson's 2019 premiere of Oba, Queen Baba King Baba, received three Bessie nominations, including Outstanding Production, Outstanding Design, of which Nigel was co-costume designer, and Outstanding Performance, ultimately receiving the 2019 Bessie Award for Outstanding Visual Design. For the second time in Whitson's career, the artist garnered one of the most prestigious awards in dance. In 2017, Whitson was part of an ensemble that took home the Outstanding Performer Award. The work was co-commissioned by Dance Based Project and Abrams Arts Center. Whitson's Oba Queen Baba King Baba engages spiritual multiplicity and the role of queerness in the divine. The work's title is based on the Aruba word Oba, which is a genderless term that has come to be known as a king. This interdisciplinary work performed by the NWA project is informed by personal narratives of queer and trans children of preachers and designed to be witnessed from above. Through movement, poetry, textile, jazz, and video art, Oba, Queen, Baba, King, Baba uncovers architectures of the body, space, and sexuality to interrogate power in ways masculinity influences the perceived histories of religion. So before we start the conversation, let's take a look at an excerpt from Oba, Queen, Baba, King, Baba. Welcome, Nigel. We are so excited that you can join us today. Um, what a fantastic clip. It it's, makes me want to get up and move. Um, could you talk about Oba Queen Baba King Baba and how the creative process unfolded for you in developing this piece? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to the whole team at UCR Arts for having me. And that introduction you gave was so good. Like the, the languages that you, the different texts that you brought together, please share it with me. Um, I love the, <laughs> how succinct it is. Um, that work really, it, it, it's interesting because it was created faster than most things I'm used to. So it was created about with, over the course of about a year and a half. Um, 
I tend to take probably twice that long to create something. And um, it was a really intense process of sort of research in spillage and a, a lot of research of looking into um, Nigerian masquerades from the Yoruba tradition, um, looking at queer parades and um, funereal traditions and the, the Afro-Baptist church. So, and, and all of which I have done some research in or have been a part of in different ways personally. So it really was this coming together of things that felt um, distinct in their own ways, but having this really clear through line for me of, of, of African diasporic spiritual tradition and seeing the ways that both mourning and celebration coalesce in Black queer tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so that the clip that you saw is one of the moments in the, in the piece where I feel all those things are, are happening in a real clear way simultaneously, as opposed to, you know, there are other moments that different aspects are highlighted particularly, but that one was one where I feel like there was this kind of crossroads moment of all of those um, research, uh, research notions, mm -hmm. different, uh, disparate traditions coalescing into one. Right. Um, it, it was, it's interesting because in the intro, it, you know, I, I read that this piece was supposed to be viewed from a, a, above. So is, is that true of the entire production? Absolutely. The entire production. Um, the, when this work was initially, the, the prompt for this work came from um, Reggie Wilson's platform of 2017, I believe, um, maybe 2016, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember the timeline correctly, where he was looking at the, the traditions of these uh, spiritual spaces in New York City that gave birth in some way to the postmodern dance movement and how there was very little conversation about this re those relationships between re these religious sacred sites and postmodern dance. Um, and dance space at the time the the provocation uh, was was forwarded by him was believed to have a slave gallery and as its upper that the upper gallery functioned as a slave gallery. Um, that piece is the thing that I really held on to because I had presented works in that building before, have been to you know workshops and other kinds of events in that space, and it has always felt. Um, heavy, maybe tense, the, the spiritual presences of the space were always palpable. Um, and it's, it's also an active sanctuary. So some of that is because there are, there are spiritual services still in that space on a regular mm -hmm. basis. Um, the week we began our um, installation uh, for the premiere, it was confirmed that the upper gallery had indeed functioned as a slave gallery um, and there has since been a lot of work done at Dance Space around uh, trying to name the, slave parish the enslaved parishioners there um, and to, to do some, I think, reclamation work um, and reparation work around the, the really wrought history that's there. Mm -hmm. So it was important for me in thinking about the, this relationship with spirituality in that particular environment to consider the ways in which the the audience was going to participate in the in this in a similar way in an active way that um participants do in in spiritual um ceremony so that it, that it is it is active and it is created with the consideration that all par all bodies in the room um contribute to the medicine um so i wanted to highlight that history so that the, it couldn't be forgotten, at least mm -hmm. for the moment of this work and hopefully forward on. It's really activate memory um, and to transform that space from being something where enslaved parishioners were you know, relegated to, to be in a space where they are unseen and unworthy of the sanctuary to that being actually a throat. Um, so the work was created for them, right? So for, you know, the my enslaved ancestors that were there. Um, and also for, we 
it was really important for all of us that the majority of the people in those seats were folks of color um, so that there was an honoring of legacies um, to, to become. Wow. Wow. Uh, so you talk about your, your research um, and discovering this. This sounds like a possibility for continued research, continued development of new pieces. Um, this is really interesting to think about the dance spaces in New York City is having this history. Um, are, is anyone, are you continuing on with this discovery or this research? I am not, not in that way specifically, but there are people that are definitely continuing that work. That's, it's a big part of Bridgie Wilson's work. And I believe mm -hmm. still doing that with dance space specifically. Dance space itself is, is, is really committed to, I, I would say they're committed just because I think there are people that um, have been vocal about the tensions that are there, the work that hasn't been done. And now right. it's, what is known that it's impossible. Um, or irresponsible, maybe I should say, because it's possible that people don't want to do the work, but they are showing up to do the work. Um, and, I, and, and that can be, I think, more, more rigorously employed across all of our, our thinking. I think what it, what it opens up is a conversation, not just about the um, lineages of, of oppression as it relates to um, slavery, in, in our enslaved ancestors, but what it also opens up around um, a genocide of Native folk and the stealing of Native land. So if we aren't actually thinking about those intersectionally, there's a disservice, right? Because we, we can't think about, it is challenging for me to think about the where these bones are buried and at dance space and not, and disconnect that from the the land that those bones are buried. Right, right. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so I, I'd like to get back to, you were talking about how you approached it, the development of this piece. Clearly you had a lot of collaborators. At one point in time, did you bring in your collaborators to help you with the development or be a critical part of, of um, the piece? Wow. Um, Kirsten Davis was there from the beginning, um, is the is founding company member um, of the NWA project and has been <laughs> fierce, fiercely in the room uh, for everything that's been created, uh, for the most part, yeah. And um, when the platform version of the work was created, it was just Kirsten and I. Um, Jean Medina was had been brought in a part of that initial um, iteration as well. Um, and I had not yet uh, figured out exactly the, um, the projection was going to work. And that was mostly kind of the, the time timing of it and thinking like, oh, in order for this thing to get pulled off, I know that it is, I know it's an evening. <laughs> And I know that you know the 20 minutes for this platform iteration is not the, the one where all of that's going to find itself. So uh, once that version was created, and that was in uh, March of March of 18, is that correct? Uh, yes, March of 18, I believe. Um, then Tuche, the lighting designer, and in Gil Sperling, the um, video and projection designer, became involved. Once that. Once that version happened, it, it just opened things up really clearly to me of what needed to happen next. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then the, the sound collaborators, I, I functioned primarily as kind of the curator of the sound um, and did a, a great deal of the editing. And a lot of that was really just a matter of being on the West Coast uh, and being really um, deeply and quickly in process. So. I needed things like, you know, I'd be in rehearsal, like, oh, I actually need to hear how this sounds right now. So I'd be editing in rehearsal. And that just ended up being a lot of what the process looked like. Uh, so the, my, my sound collaborators came a bit later, but uh, yeah, folks really showed up powerfully, collaboratively in the work, which was a blessing to have. 
Okay, well, I wanted to ask about music and sound and its influence on the development of your work. Watching Oba, Queen Baba, King Baba, I was struck by the different genres and music and rhythm and sound that were woven seamlessly together. Beautiful, just beautiful. Um, and I went back multiple times to try and listen and identify the music. So could you, could you talk about the importance of music and sound in your work? I am a huge fan of, of percussive, percussion, sound in general. Um, and I talk about the sound for this piece as a bit of a biographical discography. Um, uh, and it was important for me to just keep collecting sonic uh, contributions that help to tell um, the biographical story that is, that is in there. Um, you know, the piece is not, not at all kind of one-to-one -one autobiographical in any way, but there are, the sound has, is definitely a, pl a place where there are, are hints of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I, I, you know, I grew up with, uh, my, my mom played records. So I you know, was listening to lots of funk and, and soul music growing up. Um, and as a, as a movement artist, worked a lot, have been working a lot with jazz musicians and drummers. So they, so my, my kind of body is tuned to music in a really sensitive way. Um, and certainly working spiritually, music is, is, is such a, a support and conduit of, of, of things happening. Um, and this piece being so, so much about spirit and ceremony, mm -hmm. the the sonic story helps to, to keep the thing churning, keeping the circle moving. So it, it, yeah, it was more so than probably anything else I've made, the, the sound really was helping to drive the work. Ah, oh, interesting. So maybe this would be a good time, if you think so, that, that we'd like to show another piece of your work titled, another work of yours, Newton Called God, in part of the Unarrival Experiments number four. Does that sound good? Okay. Lindsay, could you start that? Because the technology that would allow us to see far enough into the past does not yet exist. For now, 96% of the universe is black and unknown. Black and unknown. The map is an architecture of being. Rosamond has King defines radiation as light one cannot contain. She has a poem entitled Black Body Radiation. Is black body radiation the light of the black body that one cannot contain? Black, dense, and unknown is not zero. It is 96. It is dark energy. Black magic acting upon the cosmos is dark energy. The Element of black magic. Dark energy is the aspect of the universe that early astronomers could not explain. Newton called the God nothing. A shepherd into the destinies of God. Zero is not nothing. It is the unseeable, unknown, uncontainable light. A black, so black, dark, black, black. In <laughs> Make the universe possible. Dark matter is the body stuff. The motion that precedes thought, wherein matter exists merely to make motion action. The blackness is the motion that matter, time is the space between in action of matter and motion. Well, the obvious question, could you talk a little bit about that work and, um, and the unarrival um, uh, experiments? Yes, I want to shout out Stacy Karen Robinson, whose voice you're hearing, who is a poetess, sorcerer, <laughs> working with words and voice, and is a performance artist, just glorious human being. Uh, Tuche Yasak, who you can see is also uh, working with light, and uh, Jeremy Toussaint Baptiste, who uh, contributed sound for Oba Queen as well. Um, all of us working live together. Um, the Unarrivaled Experiments is this large, expansive umbrella of works that center dark matter and dark energy um, in a 
kind of specific conversation with with blackness, queerness, and trans embodiedness, and uh, you know, it's it's has been this container for for some writing projects. The the La Mama um, experiment came with my kind of wrestling with the philosophical, social, political questions around. Um, dark matter and dark energy and what they were bringing up for me in a conversation around blackness and darkness, mm -hmm. around invisibility in a black queer body, invisibility in a black trans body. Um, and I somehow found my way to Heidegger <laughs> one time. <laughs> and uh, there were, you know, lots of things that, for, one of the things that I really held on to was um, this theory of, of unconceal, unconcealment. Um, so we started to work with thinking about how do we unconceal the dark um, and how do we treat darkness itself as a landscape and respecting the spectrum or a spectrum of darkness. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of those ideas really are strongholds for the entire project that includes uh, an exhibition, um, and that it that includes indoor and outdoor performances. So it's it's a it's a it's a hefty uh, hefty work, and the the experiments that are enumerated were these early versions of trying to work out the relationships between the performance and text. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, God bless the audience that was there at La Mama. We are going to hear the entire text. We're going to figure out how to activate the whole text. Um, and I think it was a, a beautiful and challenging experiment because of that task, um, but was so influential in understanding how these different parts were working together. That, it, again, that particular clip is, is great. And, and also spending years in New York and knowing La Mama space really well, it was like, okay, I'm there. <laughs> seems, seems great, seems great. Yeah, me too. Um, so I would like you to dive in, if, if you don't mind, to talk about your work generally. Like what, it, what are the, the themes that you're exploring in your work, past and also present? You know, are you working on anything uh, for the future right now. Just curious about um, all, all the different themes um, and subject areas that you've explored. Clearly quite a few. Yeah, that's kind of the way I get down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's things that are, uh, let's say, I would say threaded through everything. Certainly being in a relationship to uh, Yoruba cosmology, mm -hmm. um, is, is in every work, spirit is, is at the center of all things, um, trying to understand what uh, spirit wants of, of me and of process um, is a part of mm -hmm. what, ha what is happening in the work. Um, mm -hmm. I am usually uh, inspired by something that keeps me up at night. Um, some you know some something that I can't turn away away from or something that I I am that feels like I need to I need to make sense of this. Um, so the subject matter because I am really embracing being spirit led is it shifts depends on you know what what spirit is calling for in the moment. I think um, for instance this work with dark matter dark energy that is where where my my work is now and is is focused for the next few years, um, just with the, the grandness of the project, um, came out of doing research on my great grandmother um, mm. that I learned was a black Indian root worker and that my family knew very little else about her. Um, and learning about um, maroon histories and uh, the histories of fugitivity in, in my family and in, in uh, enslaved histories of the South and uh, the United States just brought me to well, what what ended up happening and I've you know spoken about this in other spaces um, so I'll be brief here but thinking about um, the fact that she I'm saying she because I know it's my great-grandmother wouldn't really 
I couldn't see her. I couldn't see a body. I couldn't even see gender. And there was something about the fact that there was, that there was this refusal to materialize that I held on to as like, oh, that is actually what this work is about. It's about mm. that refusal. Um, and it's, you know, it, it leads my work. So, you know, my, one of the other components that is also in the center for me is looking at and creating new uh, Black queer archives. Um, so I've, I've done some work with, with Audre Lorde's um, writing and created a um, live adaptation of Marlon Briggs' um, mm -hmm. iconic 1989 film, Tongues Untied. Um, mm -hmm. And those kinds of work works um, are challenging in and of themselves because these are you know iconic figures, but it's right. also trying to really find my body in those spaces and, and my like expression of, of gender and sexuality in these histories where there there was less representation. Mm -hmm. Right. And not that I'm trying to be representative of anything, but thinking about like the the responsibility of myself and my body and, and uh, relationship to the Black Queer Archive or Black Queer Archives. Um, so yeah, my my interests are <laughs> like everywhere. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, science, queerness, trying to understand like care politic against a rigorously oppressive experience of white supremacy now and in, in our in, in history um, is pushing me to especially I think with this with this new work to be thinking of what is the what are the futurities then mm -hmm. like what you know what is not just what we have experienced what we are experiencing but what are we creating in this moment that cultivates a liberated uh, future mm -hmm. uh, or liberated futurities so Right, you know, right now it is for me trying to find uh, the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians names it Ancient to the Future, which I love. So thinking about like going far enough to end up mm -hmm. in the future is a part of what ends up being in the mix for me all the time. You are clearly driven and inspired. Who are the people early on in your career and your thinking that it really inspired you? Um, and and w at what age did you realize that performance and, and being an artist and a writer was really the path that you should take? That, wow. Um, college, I would say for sure um it was when i when i learned that i had i was a double major in african-american studies um where like, my concentration was fine arts and history and then i had an interdisciplinary performance major that was theater dance and visual art <laughs> and there was something about like what those two different things were asking my brain and body to do and spirit to do that made complete sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, as a part of one of those, the performance major, um, I had to do a, an evening length concert. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna figure out how this, this research work I'm doing um, makes sense in relationship to the artwork that I'm doing. And in that process, I realized like, oh, okay, oh, that I can do. Like if, if, if this is what being a creative person means that I can actually pull from all the things that I am, I can be all the things that I am, then like, okay, I, that I can do. Um, and I you know, saw people like Arthur Aviles, who, my God, I saw him perform. Uh, and it was one of his pieces where he was, was nude at some point in it, which is a lot of Arthur's work. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, dance can be this? Okay, I can do that. Uh, and I had, you know, was dancing and training and in companies and leading a company, but it, it all felt um, uh, like, it, like, it, like it was a hobby. I hadn't yet committed to mm -hmm. 
creative practice as practice, but I had powerful people that influenced me, like Johnny Coleman, who's an installation artist, um, doing a lot of work with uh, migration um, uh, and migration histories in Ohio, Los Angeles. Um, Sharon Bridgeforth, and artists in the theatrical jazz aesthetic. So mm -hmm. that legacy of people like Lori Carlos and Robbie McCauley, um, Diane McIntyre. Interestingly, another kind of Ohio connection that I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm from Ohio, so mm -hmm. I recognize that some of this is pulling me home. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a piece to be made <laughs> of that. <laughs> I know it's the next thing I have to do, I believe. Um, I learned about the work of Betty Saar through Johnny Coleman and mm -hmm. learning of her is probably one of the greatest gifts that, that he shared with me because her work continues to be incredibly wow. inspiring to me. Um, and just, you know, the ways that she has been imagining and, and conversation with, with the spirit, um, as, as a practice as an installation artist has been really uh, influential. Um, gosh, there's so, so many, but those are, those are folks that immediately come to mind. Uh, but I, I, you know, I was probably a little late to the game um, in thinking of that as like college. I mean, I was right on time, not to say that I was <laughs> late in that way. It happened when it needed to, uh, but I didn't necessarily grow up in a home that that was trying to cultivate my creativity. My family, for my fam, have my family tell it I was going to be a writer. They that was what I did before anything else. Um, so I was left alone to write and read a lot, which was, which was great. Um, and I, I think some of what became available to me um, later in my life. You know, my early teens into early late teens into early twenties was the, the space of like uh, space of experimentation and working with people and witnessing artists that were like that were just in their practices and playful and were not trying to condition creativity for me or themselves. Wow, it's interesting because I went to New York. Um, to explore performance and performance art. And in Los Angeles at the time, there wasn't, um, there was some things going on, but it was really New York that was the center. So a lot of the influence and the interdisciplinary way of thinking and being, I remember New York providing. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was great. It was, it, it's still at my core. You know, and everything I do for UCR arts. And yeah. so, so, how do you situate yourself within the tradition of contemporary and experimental performance of the last 20, 30 years? <laughs> um, I definitely would, would want to call back out the uh, practitioners of the theatrical jazz aesthetic and, and saying that even before I knew that was the language. So, uh, performance and theater artists that were that were in, uh, and are working with um, writing as a embodied practice, uh, particularly in conversation with spirituality and Yoruba uh, more terms. Um, uh, and I, my name Lori Carlos and, and Robbie McCauley as, as folks really spearheading that um, certainly black arts movements and, and the relationships between um, politics and political creative practice um, and experimentalism. Um, I certainly was trained, my, my first MFA is in performance, so, you know, was, was definitely trained in, in, to be thinking around and, and interfacing with uh, performance art of the, you know, 60s, 70s. Um, so, 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 so black artists and, and many that were thinking about the, the body as canvas um, and the, the body as an, as an intervention in, mm -hmm. in art spaces or, or legacy right. Right. that I'm, I'm definitely benefiting from or in, in uh, conversation with. Um, 
And I would say, I mean, of the last 30 years, and I have to include hip hop in that. I'm a child of the 80s and so remix culture is, is huge uh, for me uh, and hugely influential in how I think about ideas. I mean, it's in, it's in all the music for sure. Mm -hmm. and the way that I work with music is definitely influenced um, by hip hop uh, and hip hop culture. Um, yeah, those are, those are places I would begin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your role as an, as your, your, your job as an assistant professor, um, how do you teach and influence and inspire your students in a predominantly white academic structure that stuck, uh, struggles with recognizing racism um, among its leaders in the rank and file? <laughs> how do I inspire? Inspire. Um, is that something you have to navigate? Do you feel you have to navigate it or do you feel that we've progressed enough or that this department that you're a part of really gives you the space and the support um, to really do what you want to do and what you need to do with your students? Because obviously, again, experimental choreography, interdisciplinarity, um, the times, I'm just curious. I mean, certainly it is, uh, you know, UCR is an institution, it's an academic institution, so that by definition means it has a great deal of work to do around uh, disentangling itself from white supremacy. Um, and, and I mean, there's an argument to be made of whether or not academic institutions can do that, or are they in and of themselves white supremacist institutions? Um, the dance department certainly with in you know the last few months have been doing a lot more work to be um, intentionally engaged in a conversation of where there has been um, overt or, or covert um, internalization of white mm -hmm. supremacist organizational principles, um, action, and uh, thus you know uh, an interface in the ways that that black folks, queer folks, trans folks have been um, marginalized and oppressed in the department, in its pedagogy and its curriculum, um, with of course an outwardly facing critique of what that looks like in the field, what that looks like in the university at large. Um, so, you know, all of that said, the, you know, the, the department in UCR as an institution is certainly, um, not at all able to, you know, they, they are still have work to do, right? Um, we, as a, as a department, I don't know how true this is across the university, but certainly as a department, there's a lot of academic freedom um, and encouragement to teach the work you need to teach. So I have in the last, it took me a, a, probably the first year and a half or so to really trust that fully. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that's just, you know, my, the own experiences I've had in other institutions, but to, it, it's, it's true and it's real. And I have been able to create classes and classroom experiences that, um, that are queer, queer trans um, centered and affirming, that are black centered and affirming, that don't, um, that allow me to also teach in a way that I like to think and experiment. Um, so me making space for the, 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 the classes to be healing. Um, yes, to be, to be vehicles where healing is possible, to be experimental, um, and to be a little, I don't know, to be, a li to be in the middle of unknowing, right? Like I, I think that there right. is, and that is, depending on, you know, where your academic training is, can be antithetical to what folks understand right. academic training to be. So uh, it's been, it has been good for me to be able to do the work that I, I, I feel here to do. And here meaning like in this world on this plane. Right. Um, and, but, you know, and those struggles are absolutely present in real racism, transphobia, um, homophobia, all of that have been things that I have simultaneously experienced um, at UCR. Um, and I feel 
deeply committed to creating classroom experiences where there is action and imagination beyond those paradigms. Mm -hmm. um, it is not enough and it is not the only thing that has to happen. Um, but I'm glad that I'm able to actually to, to be facilitating that part for myself and students. That's great. That's great. Um, I am looking at the time right now and I know that you have to leave right at five. And so I want to open this up to questions from uh, our participants. Not seeing any questions right now, but um, just want to let everyone know that um, we still have time if you would like to put those in. Um, I, I did have a question <laughs> for Nija. Um, I'm just wondering who, because you mentioned hip hop as one of your um, big influences, and I would just like to know who your influence, um, who you're influenced by in um, hip hop and, <laughs> and who inspired you. <laughs> I mean, everybody, I have to say everybody. Um, I mean, my company is called the NWA Project, right? So that's, that's not accidental. Um, and, you know, incredibly problematic hip hop group, misogyny and, and homophobia and all of it. Um, and it, that, that time period was a, a time period where, um, I spent a lot of time with my older cousins um, and that was a lot of the music that we were listening to. And so it, I can't hear that time and not think of like being a young person um, and, and all that I was experiencing at that time. So, so there's something also about like seeing work and there's lots of reasons for them to be controversial and lots of reasons for, for them to, as a, as a group, um, and with their music to be uh, critiqued and I, and I hold them. Um, but there's something I am attracted to with the fact that they uh, really made people mad. Like folks were afraid of that group. And like, how fantastic <laughs> to be uh, that honest, to make work that dangerously, uh, and you know it's it's music, so there's all kinds of money involved and all kinds of other shit like that. But but there is there's something for me about that like fire that I'm here for. Um, um, all things house, all things house, most things house, everything has shit. So uh, but um, just even like the history and legacy of house music, um, it's is inspirational to me. Um, God, that's it's so hard. It's hip hop. Is yeah, that's it. Uh, to say what in hip hop. Um, I'll say one person that's you know probably not well known um, is he's a, a scholar and a visual artist. Um, Jimmy Lucero is his name, and he was one of the first people that I started talking to about this dark matter, dark energy. And um, he was the person who first said to me, "Oh yeah, let's let's have more of our dark matter ciphers." So it's, it's, it's held um, as language I use in the project. Um, and so he is someone who is definitely inspiring and someone who is um, in these really magical ways also thinking about astrophysics and hip hop music uh, and hip hop culture in really incredible ways. Yeah. Too big, it's too big, Lindsay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we did have a question from one of our participants. So um, they said they had to come late. So sorry if um, you've already addressed this, but I think this is something you can speak to more. Um, can you share your thoughts on how you are producing those spaces of queer, trans-centered and affirming, Black-centered um, and affirming in the new normal of remote teaching? It sometimes feels like that type of complex and nuanced work is the work that is most difficult to translate to the emergency remote conditions, but even more important. Um, this is where folks who have already been working in that way actually don't think it's that difficult. Um, if you are already, and if you aren't, then this is a great opportunity to be, to be learning around it. So one of the things that I'm doing, um, I had the real privilege, I, I did kind of a bunched quarter situation this year so that I uh, didn't teach in the spring. Um, 
so what I'm preparing for for my teaching in the fall is um, my one of my graduate classes I'm introducing this SUSU model so that there are a few black queer and trans members of the community that will be taking the class with the students at UCR um, they're paying uh, $20 a week and th that money goes to one of them each week um, so they're paying each other to be present. I think that those kinds of principles and thinking of how um, how you're charging the students themselves to co-create uh, black centeredness. Um, and it's not just about who you bring in the room. It's not just the scholars that you have the, the students read. It is also how the space itself is cultivated, right? How, do, how conversations happen. Um, you know, all of the things we know from bell hooks and teaching to transgress and um, those kinds of ideas. But it's, I think it's actually not that difficult um, because they, they are care centered and politically centered practice. And you're either doing that and committed to doing that um, or not. The last thing I'll say with it is that, um, which also feels very kind of like uh, black thought is that it is important to go slow. Everything online takes so much more time. And so there's much less I'm finding that it's possible to do online. Um, and so to, to go deeper instead of broad. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is, would you talk a bit more about blackness and unconcealment? <laughs> blackness and unconcealment. Um, so, there is something for me around the idea that to unconceal is different to reveal a thing, that to, to unconceal a thing is to speak to the, uh, its potentiality um, as well as its presence. So when something is unconcealed, we're moving in a way that acknowledges a thing in, in its totality and not against the thing that it is not. Um, there is, for me with blackness and unconcealing blackness, um, or unconcealing darkness is the, to, it pushes back against the idea that um, blackness actually covers, right? That the, mm -hmm. the darkness itself is the thing that invisibilizes, but not as if it in and in, in of itself can't be seen. So to unconceal darkness is to treat darkness as a subject, a subjectivity, an object itself. Um, and then if we can think about that in relationship to treating blackness and transness as real and hear whether or not it is visible, um, for me, it's a part of where those things uh, intersect dynamically. Thank you. So uh, another question we have is, how do you see yourself activating live performance via hip hop, um, Yoruba, theatrical jazz, et cetera, in the present day post COVID context? That is outside of theaters or other designated performance spaces. Huge, huge. Um, a couple of ways, um, highlighting ritual and highlighting, um, I did a, a dark matter, matter cipher that occurred online in june and what was magical to me about that is that uh, the, the ciphers themselves tend to actually be very small invited audiences if there are any audiences it's very much about the live experimentation between the scholars scientists and artists this one um, we did live and online and pushed back against the seeing nature of of zoom and online performances where most of it was actually um, in the dark, right? So the, the dark matter ciphers are about experimentations in dark spaces. Um, so I'm thinking about the ways that we can um, undercut completely um, what it means to, to be in front of a screen if we're gonna do that. Um, I'm not at all committed to trying to create an online practice. Um, I know a lot of my work is, is activated in the live and that feels really important. Um, so working with museum spaces, I'm working with um, 
impact is one of the partners of this project as well, uh, New York Live Arts. And we're all thinking about um, audiences of zero, audiences of one, um, things that get shared, uh, performances that happen outside, um, all things that have, have already been in practice for me, but to be more um, strategic about eliminating aspects aspects of practice that are based on um, capitalist productivity. So that in general has meant things get real precise, things get narrowed maybe, um, and like there's less access, which all feels really good <laughs> to, to, to me in, in relationship to like black exploitation performative models and all of that. Great, thank you so much. That that's all of the questions um, we have. So, um, well, I, I yeah, I would like to um, say that some of the most of what you're talking about today is so exciting for me, for us at UCR Arts, and I hope that you continue to find ways to use our spaces to connect, to experiment. I love what you were just talking about, sort of stripping out sort of this capitalist sort of perspective of performance. And it's just, it's fascinating. It's, I wanna keep on going with the conversation, but I wanna offer more space, more support. What can we do to help you um, do the work that, that you are so compelled and passionate about? Um, so thank you for being here today and thank you for being such a big part of UCR Arts. I just really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And I didn't get to say that um, I developed Hoba Queen Baba King Baba a great deal at the Culver. Um, they have that beautiful atrium and had the wonderful uh, and unique experience of being able to create a work to be seen from above in a space that actually had the same architecture. Um, mm -hmm. That has, you know, it was such a, just a magical invitation for the work. Um, and yeah, would love to continue to work there as soon as, you know, they make <laughs> they're able to get on in the rooms. Um, and I, I wanted to just quickly say, just with the first question that came up, because it's, it's just coming back to me and I don't want the person to feel uh, dismissed by it, by saying like, it's not hard to do because of course it's hard to do. Um, that, what feels um, important in cultivating that nuance of Black and trans centered and affirming spaces is also centering care and asking folks what they need and being ready for folks to respond and to lead and for us to be wrong. Um, and I, I'm thinking of us like in the role of opening a space and facilitating a space. Um, but, but that just feels really important to, to come back to because I, don't, I um, don't want that person to feel dismissed by my initial answer um, and to really uplift that it is challenging work as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nija. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your work with us. Um, we, uh, as a reminder, we'll show a 11-minute uh, clip of Oba Queen Baba King Baba in just a few moments to close out the program. Um, but just wanted to mention, I hope that you'll all join us for our next Third Thursday Talks on October 15th with Sarah Trail. So she is the founder and executive director of Social Justice Sewing Academy. Um, and I will go ahead and um, in just a moment, I'll post the link to register for that. Um, in the chat box so everyone can see that. And also uh, their Thursday talks are made possible by, um, with the generous support of the Marjorie and Glenn Thomas Memorial Fund. And it's because of supporters and friends like you that were able to make third Thursday talks and all of our virtual programs possible. So um, if you're in the position to make a donation, we'll put that link in the box as well. Um, so again, thank you so much, Nija. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. And without further ado, um, I'll share um, Oba Queen Baba King Baba.